Amen. Amen. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis 23. When we send the link out each week, um, I like to craft a sentence or two that tells the recipients um, where the service will be going. I think you deserve to know that. And here's what I wrote, but I didn't dare send because I thought you wouldn't go for it, okay? Here's what I wrote earlier in the week. It says the Newton Church of God Seventh Day invites you to a memorial service for Abraham and Sarah, both of whom recently passed away in Hebron near Mamre on the outskirts of Canaan. The double eulogies will be delivered by Pastor Rose. In addition to reflections, worship, and a time of fellowship after the service. In lieu of flowers, thanksgiving and praise may be made to Abraham and Sarah's God, Yahweh, El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, offered up in the praise of his glory. You should tell me if you think I should have sent that. I share it with you now because I want to make the point that sooner or later, all of us at some point will become involved in crafting a death announcement. Soon enough, all of us will be planning a funeral. Perhaps you have already. For some of you, you've done it many times. Soon enough, we'll be paying final respects to someone we love. And getting a handle on life really begins with getting a handle on this thing called death. As somebody said, we're not prepared to live until we are prepared to die. It's the reality of life and death in our broken world. And the fact that it's part of Abraham's story here in this chapter, in this part of the story, the, part, the fact that the narrator gives us the details of the death of these two people, Abraham, the father of the faith, the father of the faithful, on this journey with God, now we come to where the, the Negro spiritual says, and when I come to die, and when I come to die, and here they come. They come to this place called death, and we come here now in stark reminder of the reality, the reality that eventually all of us, all of us, will come to die. Death is inescapable, inescapable. I suppose you've heard the fable about death. It's a fable, the merchant from Baghdad. He sent his servant to the marketplace on an errand and when the servant got to the marketplace, he stumbled upon death and it scared him. And he was so frightened, he got on his horse and galloped back home and said to his master, he said, I met death at the marketplace. Please allow me, if you will, to hurry. He says, I must go to Samara and hide there because I don't want death to get me. It was so horrible, he said. And so the merchant beckoned him to go and he galloped off to Samara. And then the merchant went down to the marketplace and confronted death and said, why did you scare my servant so? And death said, scare your servant? I didn't do anything. If anything, I was surprised to see him here because I have an appointment with him tonight in Samara. Death is inescapable. Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. 
So in a world that has lost its way, in a world that doesn't know what to make of death, we who know Jesus are wise to stop and reflect on death every once in a while. And that's what we will do today. Genesis 23, Sarah dies at 127 years old. Genesis 24, Abraham dies. I'm sorry, Genesis 25. In 24, after Sarah dies in 23, in 24, Abraham secures a wife. He sends his servant off back to Ur to find a wife for his son Isaac. And then in 25, Abraham dies at 175 years old. What we're noticing in these passages is that the specific details about the death of these two very important people, really, it's a footnote, just a footnote. Because most of chapter 23 is about Abraham bargaining with the sons of Ephron for, to buy a burial place. Most of chapter 25 introduces the family of Isaac and, and Rebekah and their sons being born. Only the first 11 verses of chapter 25 are about Abraham's death. And so what we're learning, what we're learning is the brevity of life and how we can be here today and gone tomorrow and how the world continues and how, you know, they have the service and they say some good words and then they go back to the church and have a potluck and say, pass the potatoes because, you know, that's kind of the way life is. It's the way life is. So let's look quickly, Genesis 23, one through three, Sarah dies at age 127. And if you read the passage, you get the sense that Abraham wasn't around when Sarah passes away. He wasn't there because it says Sarah died. And then it says, and Abraham came to mourn her death. I wonder why, I wonder what that's all about. And I did some checking this week and you know, it is possible that Sarah's death was very, very sudden. Abraham may have been gone on a trip and Sarah died suddenly. And you know, sudden deaths in some ways can be very difficult for some people. And in some ways, a sudden death can be very helpful and, and merciful. You, you spared the suffering. So possibly she died very suddenly when Abraham didn't expect and he, didn't, he wasn't right there. Or perhaps on the other hand, Abraham uh, couldn't stand to watch Sarah die. They had been together for many, many years. They had walked the journey together. They had been through all kinds of experiences together, including the miracle of God and the birth of Isaac. And is it possible that it was just too difficult for Abraham to witness the death of Sarah? So he left and then she died and now he comes back to mourn her death. We don't know, speculation, but the text indicates that he wasn't there at the time she died. And where will I bury my dead is the question now for Abraham. Should I take her back to Ur of the Chaldees? No way. Gerar, where they were down in the Gerar near in the land of the Philistines? No. Beersheba, where we left him the last time after Genesis 22. Abraham wants to bury Sarah in Hebron. Hebron has become like home. It's become the place where, you know, the home, where you come, you're away from home, you come back home. Hebron has become that place. And Ab Abraham not only wants to bury her there, Abraham wants to secure a burial place, a cemetery, a family plot, because Abraham knows his time will come later. And so he negotiates with the sons of Ephron, the Hittites, Notice in the passage that they don't want to do this deal with Abraham. 
Abraham by now is a wealthy man. He's very famous. He won the battle in chapter 14 against King Leomer. His fame is known. And they said to Abraham, no, you are our master. You know, we don't sell you land. We give it to you. Abraham said, no, I won't take it for nothing. They even offered to give him a tomb already made. But Abraham won't settle for free. He won't settle for a borrowed tomb. Abraham wants to spend the money. You know, it's, it's like David who said, I will not offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing. It's almost as though there's something sacred and sacrificial about what he was about to do. And Abraham wanted to pay the price. And eventually he paid 400 shekels of silver for a burial ground and had it deeded. The witnesses, the deed, it's his to bury his wife and then himself. And then later on, Isaac would be buried there and Rebecca buried there and others. Even, even, um, even Leah is, is buried there. This is very, very important, very, very significant. It says in Genesis 23, verses 19 and 20, that after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, before Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of, the, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Heth as property for a burial place. You know, some things are rightly left up to our imagination. Scripture doesn't tell us how they buried her. Was there a ceremony? Did people cry? What did they say about Sarah? What about Isaac? Isaac was Sarah's only child. You know, at the time, if, if when she bore him, she was 90 and she dies at 127, it means Isaac is now 37 years old. <clears throat> I wonder what he's thinking. In fact, you'll notice in chapter 24, in 24, the very last verse, verse 67, it's a very long chapter where they go to get a wife for Isaac. It says that when Rebekah came and Isaac married her, he took her into Sarah's tent and she became his wife. And it says, and he was comforted because of the death of his mother. Isaac was grieving. And we know that grief is handled differently by different people, but it is very important to grieve and it is very important to grieve well. And so for a moment, I want to reflect upon Sarah's life. And I want to begin by saying that Sarah represents the very first person who dies in that line that comes from Genesis 12. She's the first person in that line of faith because she precedes Abraham. When we, when we look at Sarah's life, what we ought to think about is the importance of the role of women in the story of redemption. In redemptive history, the role of women cannot be overstated. And when we think of the different women in that line that leads up to Jesus Christ, we talk about the bad girls of the Bible. Well, you know, Sarah is one of those not so bad girls. In fact, she's a good girl when you stop and think about it. 
And what we have here is that if Abraham is our father, as we hear, as we read in Romans 4, verse 16, Paul says, Abraham is the father of us all, the father of all those who walk in faith. Then what we have is Sarah is our mother. Sarah is our mother. When, when Luther reformed the church back in the 16th century, one of his famous lines is that you cannot have God for your father without having the church for your mother. What he was getting at is this whole idea of people who say, you know, I can, I can love God, but I don't have to have the church. And Luther said, no, you got to have both. You can't have God for your father without having the church for your mother. She is your mother. And here, you can't have Abraham as your father of the faith without Sarah as your mother of the faith. That's why we have in Isaiah chapter 51, I mentioned this earlier, God is comforting the people of Judah. Listen to what he says, Isaiah 51, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. Do you follow after righteousness? This is God's word to you. You who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, God says, and to Sarah who bore you. Look to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. The line of women of the faith, beginning with Eve, back to the announcement of the gospel in Genesis 3. The line of women really isn't there until you get to Sarah. You get to Sarah. And what we know about Sarah is that she was beautiful, very, very beautiful. At 90, at 75, at 85, 86, Sarah is causing problems for Abraham because she's beautiful and people want to take her from him. And she was the lead character in the story, as we mentioned before. She was a, a lead player in the drama. God is causing plagues upon Pharaoh and, and, and Abimelech and all kinds of problems because Sarah really was the one who, you know, drove the drama of the story of Abraham's life. And what about her character traits? Here are several things we can say. Number one, she was assertive. She was very assert assertive. And you know, when you, when you go to a funeral, people have mixed, you know, feelings and emotions and some people are praising the person in the casket and some people are having negative ideas about the person. But you know, I remember when Richard Nixon died back in 1994, you know, betrayed the country. I happened to be in California the week of his funeral. I happened to be in Pasadena and he was buried in Whittier where the, the um, Nixon library is. And I could literally look out of my hotel room and watch the procession going down the road. And it's amazing. And one commentator mentioned, it is amazing how somebody vilified, somebody who, you know, was thought to be unworthy of praise, when a person dies, we tend to focus on the good side of that person. And Sarah, for all the things that could be said about her, was a very assertive person. She was very decisive. She was very protective, very nurturing. In fact, I looked up the word protective and I got some synonyms, caring, motherly, nurturing, she nurtured Isaac. The thing that surprises us about Sarah is that she was, she's called submissive, submissive. We don't think that way about her because of her assertiveness and her passion. 
But we read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, Peter is talking to women in first century who are Christians, whose husbands are not Christians. And how does a non-Christian woman relate to her husband? And Peter says, for in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are. Like I said, most people don't think of Sarah when they think of the word submissive and submission. We stop and think about the fact that Abraham in Genesis 12, verse 2, it says, and he went out not knowing where he was going. And Sarah went with him. When you think of all the twists and turns and the different moves they made in life and how she basically cooperated with, 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 uh, with Abraham, we see the side of her now as we reflect on her life. She was submissive. And we have to believe that because the Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures. And that's what it says about her. So as we look at Sarah, and by the way, we will not deal with Abraham today. This is part one. Next week, we'll come back, finishing well part two. I decided last night that there's no way to cover both of these today very adequately and Abraham deserves his own eulogy. So now let's spend a few moments just answering the question, what is the meaning of life? When we come to a funeral, when someone dies, we're called upon to reflect and the question is, what is life really all about? I subscribe to a podcast by Dr. John Piper, Desiring God Ministries. The podcast is called Questions of Pastor John, John Piper. And here came, as I was working on my message, here came this podcast. And the question came from a woman named Abijah. Abijah, going through a very, very difficult time. And here's what she asked. She said, Dear Pastor John, hello. So, I have been dealing with much in life, which has been really, really hard for the past three years. Normally, I could face life's challenges with the assurance that God was in control and that I could trust him. But beginning in 2018, I started to get really, really depressed about the whole meaning of life and why and, and what is my purpose. And it was in the midst of my challenges that I lost something that I really, really loved. And it broke me like nothing ever has. My entire view of God and life has been shattered. I can't seem to get myself out of wondering why life is even a thing. Life, at least my life, often feels like it has no meaning. Can you renew my vision for life? Can you explain to me what is the meaning of life? End of quote. A question for Pastor John. It's a question for all of us. And we can look at Pastor John's answer, but what is your answer? And what is the biblical answer? Is the atheist Bertrand Russell right when he said, when he came to the end of his life, he said, there is no, he said, there is darkness without. And when I die, there will be darkness within. There is no splendor, no vastness of anything only triviality for a moment, and then nothing. That's Bertrand Russell. Or how about Macbeth in Shakespeare's play? 
Remember Macbeth? He says, life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, and in the end, signifying nothing, nothing. It's interesting, both of these quotes end with the word nothing, which is what atheists, you know, they say that everything came out of nothing. And, 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 and you know, we, as Dr. Sproul, R.C. Sproul was famous as saying, and I think he was quoting Jonathan Edwards, and he says, nothing is what rocks do when they're sleeping. And we have to go back to God, not nothing, but go, go back to God, the original unmovable mover, the unshakable shaker, the, the one who was there in the beginning, God. And what is his purpose for life? Why are we here? I want to suggest to you, as Dr. Piper says in his response to Abijah, he says, the meaning of life now, the purpose of life in this age is not comfort in this world. It's not escape from suffering. It is not avoidance of loss. It is not even maximizing physical pleasure. It is not amassing riches. It is not achievement. It is not, it is not fame. It is not the right of, uh, to be healthy and to be respected in this world. Those are not the things that define real authentic life, Piper explains to Abijah. And then he says, here's what life means. He says, the meaning of life is to know God and to enjoy God. That's what the Shruta Catechism says. The question is, what is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? And the answer is to know God and to love God and to enjoy him forever. Piper says, the meaning of life is to know God and to enjoy God and to reflect some of the beauty of God as we know him in Christ. The meaning of life is to know God, enjoy God, and to reflect some of the light. Some of the light. You know, when John, in his prologue in John chapter 1, John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And the glory there speaks of the light. John says, in him was a light. And that light is the life of men. The light, the light that shines from Jesus is the light of men. And here Piper says, our goal in life is to share the beauty of that light. It is to reflect that light. And so today, as we reflect, as we think about life and its meaning, as we prepare to finish well, I want to offer you just a couple of principles that I believe can help us and guide us and steer us right as we reflect here today on the meaning of life. Principle number one, if we're going to finish well, we need to remember that eventually it all goes back in the box. It all goes back in the box. I'm borrowing that concept from John Ortberg, a preacher from California. John tells a story that when he goes back to see his grandma, which is a fun thing to do, he said they spend most of their time playing Monopoly. Monopoly, for those of you who are not from the American culture, Monopoly is a game. It's a, a board, a, a board game, and you go around, the, you, you buy, you have money, and you buy property, Park Avenue, Park Place, and, 
and, and you know, you, you're, the goal is to amass the wealth. And, and he says his grandma, nobody can beat her in Monopoly. She's fierce. She's a wonderful, meek lady. But when you put her in front of Monopoly, she becomes a different person. And nobody can win his grandma. And he says she always comes to the end of a game of Monopoly by saying this. Now, John, always remember, when we're done, it all goes back in the box. All the pieces and uh, the board and the little houses and all the stuff, it all goes back in the box. That's really true. And think of your box, your box. Your box is life itself and all that it contains. You come to this place in your life when you, you're faced with your mortality and it's good to remember that at the end of the day, all the stuff, you know, the stuff that we accumulate and the stuff that we stuff in, get all you can and can all you get, it all goes back in the box. And that gives us perspective as we make our way through life and we try to finish well. The second principle is this. If you want to really make a difference, if you really want to finish well, then live for something bigger than yourself. Live for something bigger than yourself. Abraham and Sarah, you know, they lived their own lives and tried to cultivate their family and did what they did. But ultimately, when you reflect upon their life, when you look back at Abraham and Sarah, it is a reminder that as we talk about them and study them thousands of years beyond their life, that what they were doing, they were living their lives for something bigger. You see, some people live for the dot, not the line. Some people live just for today. And yes, we ought to live in the moment. We have to live in today, but we have to live today with tomorrow in view. We have to live. We have to live in a way that reflects that we are not just eking out an existence and living just for the moment, but that we're living, we're living for something bigger than ourselves. And the best life that you can live is a life lived from a divine center, a divine center, a center where the different parts of your life come together in a congruency. That's where Abraham came in chapter 22, a divine center from which you live the kind of a life that basically says, I want to live every day in the center of God's will where I can say, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll be what you want me to be. And that's where Abraham came as he laid it down at Mount Moriah. You know, like we said last week, what, we, what we're not told in the story is what happened when they got back home. Can you imagine how Sarah reacted when, when Abraham told her what he was going to do with Isaac and how God delivered them and how that transformed their lives? as they learn to trust God and love God and surrender to God and live their lives in the center of God's will. Yes, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll be what you want me to be. It all goes back in the box. That's what Abraham was doing when he was putting Sarah's remains in that cave, in that box. It all goes back in the box. We live for something bigger than ourselves because it's all going to go back in the box. 
And then thirdly, remember that finishing well at the end of life is simply the cumulative result of finishing each day well. Finishing well at the end of life is simply the result of finishing each day well. You can't not finish each day well and then finish life well at the end of the journey. What happens at the end of the journey? You see, life is not a destination. Success is not a destination. Life is a journey. And what you come up with at the end of the destination, when you get to the destination, you're simply looking at what happened along the way as you lived your life, as you finished each day well. And so today, we're being encouraged as we reflect on Sarah and Abraham's life to live intentionally. The way you finish each day well is that you live that day with intentionality. You know why you wake up. Here recently, whenever I kneel to pray in the mornings when I get up, I say what I've heard Dr. Erwin Lutzer say. I say, Lord, glorify yourself today at my expense. I'm giving you my day living intentionally, keeping short accounts, short accounts. Don't carry over to tomorrow what can be done today. Short accounts, cancel your debts with people. Say you're sorry, ask forgiveness. Make every day count, live for the moment, lean into the moment, but live your life looking ahead and finishing each day, each day well. You know, one of the ways that we can kind of, you know, pull together this, this whole question of the meaning of life is to reflect, is to think of our life as a story, a story. And I'm thinking as we look at Sarah's life about her story, at Abraham's life about his story, and you ought to look at your own life and realize your life is a story and you're writing a chapter a day. You're writing a chapter a week, a month, a year. You're putting in a new sentence, a new paragraph. And, and how are you crafting that? And um, Rachel held Evans a young woman in her 30s who died just a year and a half ago or so. A wonderful writer, several New York Times bestsellers. She left a two-year-old daughter behind. It's, it's just still painful to think about the impact she was having and how she got sick, uh, I think an asthma attack and got some medication wrong prescription, and she went into a coma and died. I have watched her funeral and reflected on her life. And one of the things that Rachel Held Evans is noted for is her insistence that we tell our story and to tell our story, we have to think about our story. And we have to be careful about what our story actually says. And I want to read you this quote. Rachel Held Evans, her book is called Inspired, this particular book. And in this book, she says, Jesus invites us into a story bigger than ourselves and bigger than our imaginations. And yet we all get to tell this story. Listen to this. We get to tell this story with the scandalous particularity of this moment and this place. 
we are storytelling creatures because we are a, we're fashioned in the image of a storytelling God. So may we never neglect that gift of story. May we never lose our love for creating and telling our story, end of quote. So the question today as we wrap up is what is your story? As we reflect on Sarah's story, as we reflect on the, to, to quote Rachel Evans, the scandalous particularity of this moment in this place, COVID-19, winter storms, lots of people dying, everything up in the air. As, as we reflect on the scandalous particularity of this time and that we're living through an era in history where which generations to come will think about and talk about and write about, what is your story? What is your life? What will they say at your funeral? What will your obituary, how will your obituary read? And we're given, we're given great encouragement in the scriptures in this regard. Because you see, a lot of us think that, you know, I don't really have any story. I don't, I'm, I'm just a pity little person and, you know, what is my, who would want to hear my story? And the Apostle Paul, in encouraging the Corinthian church, the Corinthian brethren about life and the meaning of life and how we look at our lives in relationship to the death and the dying and the suffering and the meaninglessness that is going on all around us as Abijah posed to Dr. John Piper. How do you put this all into perspective? And here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And with this, I close today. And we'll pick up again and talk about Abraham and summarize the whole question of the meaning of life, perhaps in a deeper way. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Just pause for a moment. Back in those days, they, they didn't have banks like we have banks today and vaults to put our important things. And so people hid their money in the ground. They got clay jars and clay pots and, and put important items and dug a hole and put it in there in order to protect it from the knowledge of other people. And Paul takes that analogy here and Paul says, we have this treasure. He's speaking about God's investment in the treasure, the Holy Spirit. When, when you and I came to Christ, God put his spirit in us, a new spirit, new life. Like a dead corpse, God breathed the life in us. And Paul says that this life of Christ that lives in us, Christ in me, Christ in you, the hope of glory, this treasure, Paul says basically here, we carry this around in earthen clay jars, broken clay pots. The, 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 the pot, the clay jar is not worth much. But what's on the inside? is precious, precious to God. But, but we carry, he says, we have this treasure in earth and clay pots in order that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The reason we have these frail bodies of ours, the reason we carry this treasure in this very frail vessel 
is so that God can prove that the power is not about us, but really about him. And therefore we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed, and we are perplexed but not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Verse 10, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, in order that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. You see, in my body, and those of you who struggle with health issues, and I'm thinking of you know, people like our dear brother Kevin, who has struggled with this unique disease and, and the challenges that we face. Uh, Paul says that we carry about, we, 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 we go around always, as he says here, um, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We carry that mark on the inside of us in order that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Verse 11, for we who live are always being delivered to death for Jesus' sake in order that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh so that death is working in us, and Paul is referring to himself and Timothy and those who labor in the gospel, but he says the life is working in you. He's putting himself on the line at times on the edge of death, and death is working in him, and through that death, Paul says life the life of Christ through the gospel is working in you. That is great encouragement today. I hope you are encouraged. As we come to the end here and as we wrap up, we're going to sing a song, Faithful One. And I believe that as, as, as Abraham laid his wife, Sarah, the love of his life in that cave in Matpila, and as he walked away and went back to his tent, I suppose they gathered and they had a meal and they reflected. I believe the old man who, if Sarah was 127 when she died, Abraham was 137, almost 140 years old, I believe that Abraham for sure, if even late that night when he laid to sleep, when he put his head upon the pillow and, and went to sleep for the first time with Sarah in the grave, I believe Abraham's thoughts zeroed in on the faithfulness of his God. The God who called him from Ur of the Chaldees, the God who led him, the God who delivered him, the God who brought him to where he now was, bereft of his wife, but still loved and comforted by the God who is the faithful one, the El Shaddai, the Jehovah Jireh. That is the message, and that's where we find meaning in life, and that's where we end today. Let's sing together as we worship our God.